Well, Lord, we come before you humbly, and we're here to worship you in this place, God. I pray that you give us the strength to draw the water when, from the well when our arms just, we can't do it anymore, Lord. We rely on your strength this morning, God, and we invite you into this place, Lord. We, we cry out from the depth of our soul, Lord, because we are thirsty, and we want a greater drink of you, Lord. We know that we can rest in you and the joy that your salvation promises, Lord, that while we were your enemies, while we are still sinners, that you sent your son to die in our place that we might live, Lord, that this joy of our salvation would not just interact here, Lord, but it would spread out like wildfire into this town, Lord, that they would see that you are good and your mercy does endure forever, Lord. Lord, we are here to worship you in this place and we lift your name on high. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and join us as we worship this morning? the storm that surrounds me with just one word the darkness has to retreat just takes a touch with just one touch and I feel the presence of heaven just one touch with just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our god can't do there's not a mountain that he can't move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can't do just one word with just one word you hear what's broken inside me Just one word, and you revive every dream. Just one touch. Just one touch, and I feel the power of heaven. With just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can't move. No praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. No, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall he can't break through. No praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Yes, God, we rest in that knowledge that there's nothing too big, nothing too strong for you, Lord. That you can move our mountains, that you can break our chains. Hallelujah, Lord. We worship you, God. Let's sing, I will believe. And I will believe for greater things. And there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. And I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. And I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like His power, there's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can't move, no praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can't do, no, there's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a prison wall He can't break through. No praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do, Lord. We worship you. We sing out, Lord, we will believe. For greater things. 
there's nothing that a guy can't do, no. Amen, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, God, we rest in your greatness and your strength, Lord. That you broke our prison walls, Lord. That we can stand here and worship you, Lord. We worship you. And in the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light until from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. From the virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom come and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the lost. For even in your suffering you saw to the other side Knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the Spirit Three in one God of glory Forever to the King of Kings. Let's sing it again. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. The morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. Till the stone was moved for good, though the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. This gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not pain. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three one God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, Praise forever to the King of Kings. And praise forever to the King of Kings. And praise forever to the King of Kings. This God, we give you praise. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Who is like you, the Lord God Almighty. Lord, you are greater, you are stronger. We worship you in this place this morning, Lord. Hallelujah.
of the blind there's no one like you not like you into the darkness you shine and out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you not like Sing it out. You know it. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our Water you turned into wine. You opened the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. Not like you. Into the darkness you shine. And out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. like you our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome in power our God our God our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then you could ever stop us. And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then you could ever stop us. And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then you could ever stop us. And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then you could ever stop us. And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand against? Our God, oh, our God is greater, our God is stronger. Then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then it could ever stop us. And if our God is with us, then what could stand
We rest in the greatness and the goodness of our God, knowing that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. For we are found free, free in your freedom, Jesus Christ, our friend and our Savior, our wonderful counselor, who is lacking the Lord God Almighty. Lord, you're greater, you're stronger. Sing that chorus one more time. Our God is greater. My God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. says this. It says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of all praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nation are idols. But you know, the Lord, the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Yeah. It goes on. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Amen. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. And he will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. And let the sea resound all that is in it. The fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for He comes. He comes to judge the earth. And He will judge the world in His righteousness and the peoples in His faithfulness.
and shake before him the demons run and flee and at the mention of the name king of majesty there is no power in hell nor any who can stand before the power and the presence of the We prepare for the tithes and offerings. Uh, you know where the basket's at. If you want to give online, you can do that at DesertCreekFellowship.com. Right from the home page, there's a giving button. Let's turn this morning to Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. There's so much I want to show you today, and of course, I'll never get through it all. We're entering into a time and a season of authority. And I don't know a better way to say it than that. Authority that will be challenged, authority that will be tested, and authority that will be executed, right? We're, we're in a season of that. And so I want to share a lot of things with you. And today's tithe message in some ways actually ties into that as well. Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. I just love this passage. After Jesus and his disciples arrived at Capernaum, 
the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your temple, uh, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Why, yes, he does, he replied. Jesus did not pay the temple tax. Okay, just if you didn't know, he didn't do that. And when Peter came, Peter comes back to the house. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. And I love this about the Lord. This is, this is his nature. See, Jesus was a prophet. He knew what was going on. And he, he's doing an end around, right? So he already knows what's happened. So Jesus is the first to speak. What do you think, Simon, he asked? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? Well, from others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said. Jesus was making it clear, I'm the king's son. As the son of the king, I don't have to pay the temple tax. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not cheating. I don't owe the tax. Sons don't pay the tax. Listen now. But that we may not cause an offense, go to the lake, throw out your line, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. I want you to understand. See, Peter was going to have to face these Pharisees again later. Hey, where's that, uh, where's that tax that you said your teacher pays? He was going to have to go back at some point. Not only did Jesus provide the money to pay it, but he also covered Peter at the same time for my tax and yours. He could have just said you get a two drachmas, right? And then you're on your own because you opened your mouth and you went out and just, well, you stepped in. It's what you did. You were talking when you shouldn't have been talking. I think we all have a tendency to do that. We have a tendency to step in things that we didn't mean to step in. We, we are exuberant and we're excited and, and, and we make mistakes. And what I want you to see in all of this, when you step out into those things and you step out in faith, Jesus always has your back. He always has your back. Sometimes it just doesn't seem like Jesus has your back. Always, he does. He backed Peter's move. Do you understand? He paid both taxes. Do you get that? Boy, amen or some nodding. Amen. I don't know. Wiggle your eyelids a little bit just so I know you're not asleep. When we talk about authority, sometimes we overstep our authority. You overstep your authority in the arena of spiritual warfare, it doesn't take you very long to figure out you overstep. Right, you, you start getting hit, you start getting hurt, and you'll find physical manifestations from spiritual warfare. Well, I think the same is true when we're talking about money. I, I need you to understand, all business transactions come with risk. All of them do. There is no business transaction that doesn't have risk. If you start a small business, I guarantee you there will be risk. Guaranteed. You might lose something. The idea is that I make more than I lose. Does this make sense? I just want you to understand, friends, there's room for mistakes. Sometimes what happens, you know, people, I'm, I'm, my nature is one of a perfectionist, and that's just a terrible nature to have. It's, just, it's a terrible nature. Because what happens is when you do something new, I want to be excellent at it. You're never excellent at something you try the first time. Usually you stink at it. You're just very bad at it. But, but that's not what perfectionism is. We want to be excellent at it. I'm trying to help you understand there's room for mistakes in the spiritual life. There's room to make mistakes. You don't have to get everything right. Jesus will cover the mistakes as long as you're making them honestly, right? It, it, Father, forgive me for the sin I'm about to commit. That's not an honest mistake. He makes up the difference. And in Matthew 25, uh, Jesus shares a, a parable. In the NIV, it's called the bags of gold. And the master, he, he gives wealth to his different service. And he says, go and do business with this. I want you to understand, the master knew full well there would be wins and loses. Right? 
You're going to play the stock market. Lots of people want to get rich in the stock market. They get one win, and they're a genius. <laughs> and they get one loss, and they're an idiot. You can't, you can't live like that. The average stock trader, in general, is wrong 85% of the time. Well, if they're wrong that often, how are they making a living? Because they keep their mistakes, their losses small, and they let their winners run. So let your winners run and keep your losses small. That's all. There's room for mistakes, and that's the part I want you to see. As we step out, we step out in faith. Peter got out of the boat in faith. That's a, that's a, that's a big step. All Jesus ever asks of you is just to do the best with what you have. And he'll teach you the rest. And you don't need to get it all right day one. There's room for mistakes. Do you understand that? Is that okay? Jesus, help us today. Father, help us to be okay with being human. Help us to be okay with not being perfect. Help us to be okay with letting you lead and letting you teach. Father, today I submit myself to you. Help me to be the man you've called me to be. And Father, in this house now, I bless this people. I bless them financially. I call them the head and not the tail. I say over them, I speak over them. They will lend to many and borrow from none. Father, where there is still debt in this house, I condemn it, I rebuke it, I bind its power in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you would release them from the bondage of debt in Jesus' name. And you would in turn give them great provision that they could be a blessing on every occasion. In Jesus' name, amen. With that, I also want you to know, um, you know, I get, I get different requests by email, different parts of the world, different people having different needs at different times. Um, you might remember Lorraine uh, Amari. She, well, she was here for some time. She's back in Tanzania. She's getting a group of people together, and they want to go into another area and share the gospel. But, of course, they need money to do that. We couldn't possibly answer every single request that comes in. But if that's something that God puts on your heart, um, just oh, if you do it online, just make a little note. If you do it here, just put on the envelope that it's for Lorraine. Also, uh, Bibi, you might remember we helped her get her car uh, going again, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, just didn't have enough money for tires. Now, the whole amount we sent her would barely buy tires here. Um, she got the whole car fixed, pretty much. Yeah, praise the Lord. So, But we still need tires. So if that's something that's on your heart, I just want you to know that there's lots of opportunities to give. And if you want to be part of those specific things, the door's open for you to do that. All right, are you ready? Had a had a friend when we were in high school, we, we did a lot of four-wheeling, and they had a little bumper sticker that said, get in, sit down, shut up, and hang on. <laughs> I kind of feel that way a little bit this morning. We're going to tackle topics. Some of this you've heard before, some of it you haven't heard, but it's timely, and it's time for us to step into these things. I, I wasn't joking when I said authority and challenges to authority are coming. The reason is, is the armies are gathering. They are gathering. And some of them know who you are. Some of them don't know who you are yet. And they will test that authority. You might remember the sons of Siva. Jesus I know, Paul I know, who are you? wasn't that the demon wasn't willing to submit to these sons of Siva. They just didn't know who he was. Do you have the authority? They challenged his authority. Well, when they challenged, he could not respond, and he went away bloody and naked. Let's turn this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to begin in verse 4. The big take home today is that in all games, there are rules. Always. There are always rules. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Now listen. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. If you want the crown, you have to compete according to the rules. Now, you can win not playing according to the rules, but you won't get the ribbon, you won't get the crown. You understand, we call those people cheaters. We disqualify them. We, we, we remove them from their position of glory. Uh, some years back, Lance Armstrong was dethroned, and largely because it was shown he was cheating. It's unfortunate. You guys ever play Monopoly? Monopoly is not allowed in my house. <laughs> and if I was to take a poll of raised hands, I'd be willing to bet there are other houses Monopoly is not allowed in. Okay, and the reason is, it's largely because Monopoly's rules are fluid. And what I mean by that, if you read the lid, when you open up the box, you can make whatever rules you want at the beginning of the game. Insider deals, insider trading, the bank can make loans, people can make loans, they don't have to make loans. You can buy the first house for free and the second house is dope. You can make whatever rules you want. And because the rules are fluid, people get very frustrated with the game. Uh, my my in-laws are teaching me spades. That game has got a lot of rules to it. We've been playing for a number of hours now, and I have to tell you, I don't think I understand everything I think I know. And we'll, we'll play for a little while, and it's like, oh, yeah, well, this is what it's like, but that wasn't that way last time. It's, oh, well, it's Tuesday. <laughs> oh. Okay, I'm joking, but sometimes the rules to the game seem so incredibly complex. Chess, on the other hand, chess is a very simple game. Now, it takes a lot of thought, but I know the rules. And the rules remain the same no matter where I play. I can go anywhere in the world, and the rules are the same. You need to understand that when we deal with spiritual powers, the rules have been established from the beginning, and they remain the same. Let's pray. Father, help me today. Holy Spirit, come. I pray you'd help me not go beyond, even an even a iota beyond what's written. But Father, help me to bring out the truths of your word so that I can help equip the saints for the things you've called them to. Help me today in Jesus' name. Amen. So, there are rules to all contests. Always rules. There's rules to battles, and if you want to win the prize, you need to compete according to the rules. You can still win. You remember the, 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 the Cobra Kai where he sweep his knee. Okay, well, he won, but he was disqualified because he didn't play according to the rules. One of the first rules you need to understand about spiritual warfare is that realm is more real than this realm. And I know that's really hard to get your head around. 2 Corinthians 4.18, Paul says this. You don't need to turn there. I'll just read it. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I think as humans, it's very easy for us to get caught up in this realm. This is the realm we were born into. It's the realm that makes the most sense to us. But what you need to understand is the things you can see, smell, taste, and touch, they're only temporary. They will not last forever. Everything you see around you will one day disappear. The eternal, those things are really real, although you can't see them. I mentioned last week, and I mentioned again today, I, I know many of you are going through very real spiritual battles. And my job as the pastor is to help equip you for these battles. God has called you, he's called each of you to work 
There is a thing for each of you to do. And it's different for each of you. But he has synchronized his body. And if you're going to complete the work he has for you, you're going to need to lay hold of it. And that means your enemy is going to resist you. That's his job. You need to understand not only what your weapons are, but how to use them. And more to the point, you need to understand your authority versus his authority. You need to understand where your authority ends and where his picks up, and where his ends and where yours picks up. Sometimes what happens is people enter a battlefield, and they get badly hurt on that battlefield. And the reason is they'd entered a battlefield they had no business being on. They were taking hold of spiritual things they had no business taking on. Now, I've, I've mentioned Sun Tzu a number of times. Uh, he was a, a great military strategist. Um, over the years, his comments on battle have been written down and collected in a book called The Art of War. Here's one of his comments. He says, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not your enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. And if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Now, this is, of course, not Scripture. But nonetheless, it's true, and we can learn from it. We can start this process pretty much anywhere we want to, but I think the best place to start it is in the realms of authority. Knowing where your authority is and where... His authority is. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. And I think if you pay attention in your own life, this is what I'm seeing in a lot of places, a lot of different people. What's happening is they go out in the battlefield and they take, they they lay hold of a victory. And then a few months later, they suffer a great defeat. What's happened is, They have not understood their enemy. You come to the battle and you fight and you take the enemy's, you take all of his ground. And you think the battle's over. He doesn't think it's over. And then you've got your guard all laid down and everything and he comes back and he clobbers you. And it's like, what happened? You don't know your enemy. You don't know how he fights. You don't know how he works. So let's begin with some scripture then. 1 Corinthians 2.9. In this passage, Paul is quoting, I I love how Paul does these things. I mean, Paul, he'll, he'll, he'll take part of a passage and quote that, and he'll weave, he'll weave all these things in. He'll quote from the Septuagint, he'll quote from all these wonderful things. And he says this, he says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived. Now, I took just a quip there, it's completely out of context, I'm aware of that. But I want you to understand what he's pointing out, what he's revealing here. The spiritual realm cannot be handled with natural senses. Your eyes have no value there. Your ears have no value there. Your hands have no value there. The things that you use to interface with this world and to discern this world have no value in that realm. You must use your spiritual eyes. In your spiritual ears. You must use your faith. The other thing you need to understand about the spirit realm. Everybody has an opinion of it. Millions upon millions of books have been written about spiritual things. Only the Bible will reveal the truth. That is the only place you can get your truth about this realm. It can only be seen and understood through the scriptures. The very simplest, and I know I've shared this with you before, I'm going to share it again. The simplest place to begin is you need to understand there are two kingdoms. There's not just one. Some people say, well, God has a kingdom, but the devil doesn't. That is not true. He has a kingdom. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, Jesus is speaking, and and he makes this very clear. Uh, Verse 25, and Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. How can his 
kingdom stand. He has a kingdom. And it's a real kingdom. And Jesus continues, and if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by who then do your people drive them out? And so then they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Two kingdoms, kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God, and they are at war with each other. You can believe it, you cannot believe it, you can participate in it or not participate in it. It doesn't matter. They are at war, and you will either be part of the battle or the casualties of it. I, I wish I had something simpler for you, but that is how this works. Now, what brought about this dialogue? Jesus is speaking with the Pharisees, and they're saying it's by, it's by the prince of demons, by Satan, that you're driving out demons. And Jesus is just correcting their theology. Jesus has just cast out a demon. What I want you to know is that when a demon is cast out, it brings these realms that are invisible, it makes them visible in an instant. It's very rare that we see with our physical eyes demonic activity. Sometimes what will happen is there will be an outburst or something. We recognize it in our spirit that that's demonic activity. But it's not often that we see it with our eyes. Sometimes we do. But if you cast the demon out of a man, it's made immediately clear to everybody around you what's happened. And you see the starkness of both realms coming together. They're both revealed in power in that moment. The kingdom of God comes into contrast with the kingdom of Satan. And so when, when a demon is cast out, it reveals the battle, it reveals the other realm, but it also reveals another truth. The kingdom of God is more powerful than the kingdom of Satan. That's an important thing for you to understand. It's one of the reasons the devil hates demons being cast out. It reveals what he's trying to do in the secret place, in the hidden place. Now, oh, yeah, yeah. I may not even get through part of this. One of the key verses that you're going to find in Scripture on spiritual warfare is in Ephesians chapter 6. Now, verse 12, Paul writes, and I'm going to read this from the ESV. You will, there's many translations. They all read a little bit different. Paul writes this. He says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, if you're in a paper Bible, the word places should be in italics. If you've got a digital Bible, there should be three little dots by it. Some translations don't include that. Um, but the word places was added by the translators. It, it more accurately should read spiritual forces in the heavenlies. Now, another thing I want you to see about this, where it says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers. Rulers carries a connotation that the truth is it's just it's lost on English readers. The word here in Greek is aki, and it does mean ruler. It's not it's not improperly translated, but it doesn't carry the connotation. If you go to a graduation, they have what they call a commencement, and the commencement is a whole bunch of people that are going to come up. So it begins typically with a valedictorian. And then others will come up. The word aki carries this connotation of a much larger group. And it carries a connotation um, kind of like our government, right? So if you think about our, our government, we have a president. And the president is seated over governors. And governors are seated over mayors. And, of course, they all argue about authority. But in general, that's kind of the process. That's a... Maybe a bit of an oversimplification. But I want you to understand there's a hierarchy. There's somebody in charge with somebody under him and somebody under him and somebody under him. It is a descending order of authority. So 
This word aki, it means a descending order of rulers in procession. That's what it means by rulers. What I want you to see is that the kingdom of Satan, contrary to most Christians' belief, is not a, just a mishmash of beings. They are highly organized, they're intelligent, and they work a lot like a military works. They take orders and they give orders depending on their realm of authority. Now, I could literally spend the entire rest of the afternoon going through just this passage in the Greek, and um, time just doesn't allow that. I want to share with you a more literal translation of this passage. Now, I always get nervous when I'm in a meeting and people do this. And so I'm not trying to rewrite the Bible. I'm not trying to give you Rod's interpretation. Essentially, what I've done is I have gone through all of the Greek words, compared those to all the translations, and kind of brought together a mash of the translations together, where the translation draws out the, the word and its meaning. Because each translation does it a little different. So, if you were to take this passage and go back to the Strong's Concordance and read each of these words, this is what you would come up with, and I encourage you to do that. So, for we are not wrestling. Wrestling is, a, is an interesting term. Uh, Wrestling is a team sport, but it's really a highly individual sport, right? So we have a wrestling team, but we have individuals. And when you wrestle with somebody, not typically, I mean, rugby is a team wrestling with each other, but wrestling is really an individual sport, and it takes my entire self to wrestle. All of me wrestles. It's, a, it's an intense thing for you to engage in. For we are not wrestling against people made of flesh and blood but against persons without bodies. The evil rulers, again, in a descending role of power, rulers of the unseen world, mighty satanic beings and great evil princes and dark, pardon me, great evil princes of darkness who rule this world. The connotation in the strongs of these, of these uh, rulers are those who would influence people of the world. They are influencers. They influence people to dominate them, right? So I, I want to, this is what witchcraft is, right? When I want you to do what I want you to do and I influence you in such a way to make you do it. I try to get you to think it's your idea. Oh, I would like to do that. That's witchcraft. And against a huge number of wicked spirits in the region above the sky. Now, when you read it like this, I want you to recognize the first off, Satan isn't in hell. Do you know most Christians think Satan's in hell? That happens at the very end, way at the very end. He's not in hell today. He, he rules a kingdom, and he inhabits the heavenlies. Now, I want you to notice that these rulers are ruling from an unseen place, it says. It's a heavenly realm, a region above the sky. So you think about our sky and our upper atmosphere where the air is thin and rarefied. It's way above that. And these world dominators, these rulers, they rule under Satan in a hierarchy of authority. He's the chief. There's princes under him. There's kings under him. And under the kings, there are lessers. We move all the way down, just like a government would move down. Now, to understand what's actually happening here, we need to talk about what the heavenlies are. Uh, I want you to understand from the very beginning, Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. There's always been more than one heaven. There are always, that's always been the intention. The heavens have always been plural in form. And then if you'll marry with that 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, I want you to listen to what Paul says. He says, I knew, I know rather, a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which a man cannot utter. From this passage, we learn that there are a minimum of three heavens. He was caught up to the third heaven. 
Doesn't mean there aren't more. Right? Some people say, well, I went to the seventh heaven, or I'm on seventh heaven. Well, I can't give you any scriptural backing for that. What I can tell you is the Bible teaches there are at least three heavens. There's a minimum of three heavens. And logical thinking helps us understand if there's a third, there must somewhere be a first and a second. Right? That's just simple logic. Now, Paul says the same thing if you were to go over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9. Paul's speaking of Jesus, and he says this. He says, he who ascended is the one who also descended far above all the heavens. All, in English language, all means more than two, right? If I say all my kids, and I've got one, that doesn't make a lot of sense. If I say all my parents, and I've got two, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. All indicates more than two. So again, all these things are fitting. And we learn from this chapter of 2 Corinthians. Paul knew this man who was caught up to the third heaven, and Paul identifies the third heaven as a place called paradise. It was a place where things were heard that men can't repeat. So I would submit to you that logically speaking, this third heaven is the region where God reigns. This is his kingdom. This is his throne, the kingdom of heaven. It's likely God's realm. The first heaven you and I are familiar with, right? We get up in the morning, we look out and we see the first heaven, the air, and above it, the rarefied air, and above it, space. That would position the second heaven somewhere between the first and the third. Second heaven has to be in here someplace. And this is exactly the picture that you're going to see in Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. You might remember Daniel had prayed and he wanted to know more about a vision that God had given him. And he begins to seek the Lord. And then in verses 2 through 8, three full weeks later, three weeks later, a man appears to him and he brings the answer that Daniel had been seeking. Three weeks. And then in verse 12, we learn why it took three weeks. And then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. From the day, from the day, from the beginning. Now listen, he explains why. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. There's your three weeks. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the king of Persia. Pardon me, I was left there with the kings of Persia. And came to me, you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. From the day David, uh, Daniel, from the day he sought God, the answer was released. It took three weeks for the man to break through. And I'm using man in quotes because... It just says he's a man. And he tells him why. He says, I first had to contend with the prince of Persia. And after that, he was left contending. So he contends with the prince of Persia. And after that, he's left to contend with the kings of Persia. You see the hierarchies forming. There is a prince, and under the prince, there are kings. So the prince of Persia is the principality the great ruler over the area of Persia, a satanic angel that controls that area. And the kings of Persia are the descending authorities that run underneath that prince. Again, think president, governors, mayors, that type of thing. And in this, we're going to see a new figure too. His name is Michael. Michael is an archangel who came to help. If you go over to chapter 12, verse 1, There'll be a little bit of information about him. We're going to learn that he is the prince over Israel. He is the chief prince, the chief angel. And that's where we get the term archangel. He is the ruler above, right? So we might call the prince of Persia the archangel over Persia. But he's a bad guy, not a good guy, right? Michael's a good guy, not a bad guy. What I want you to understand is there are good and bad angels 
but rule over areas. Now I want to weave in more of this next week. I got two whole minutes left, so we're good. What I want you to see is that there are powerful rulers that rule in this middle heaven. And this man who was coming to Daniel had to break through. It took time for him to break through. He left the third heaven. Daniel's in the first heaven, right? The, the underneath the sky. He prays and he sets into motion a war. He sets armies on both sides into motion by his prayers. And then the man who's coming, he has to break through this middle section. You ever heard the old time Pentecostals? I say, well, I just had to pray through. That's what they're talking about. I have to pray through. I, I have to. There's resistance in this middle arena. Now, I, well, I'm just going to go over a little bit. It's important. I want you to understand that this second heaven, it is Satan's, where Satan's kingdom is. He has under him princes and kings and rulers that rule under him, a descending authority. They're all rebels. Okay, you just need to understand, they're all rebels. Now, if we go over to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, need to show you something there. Paul says this, he says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. You were a rebel. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Who's the ruler of the kingdom of the air? Satan. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. His purpose is to make them rebels like he is. Right? This, this, what he's trying to do is produce rebellion in them. It's the same thing he did in heaven. He went and got a third of the angels to rebel. And you know how he does it? You know what? Michael, great archangel, you're just being wasted here. What you need, you need to be in a place where your abilities could really be put to work. You should come and join me in my kingdom. You think, well, that's just silly. third of the angels fell for it, and most of the world has. We've become rebels against God. What I want you to see in this is Paul is identifying a second realm of authority. We, we might call this another region of authority where Satan will also try to exert his authority over you. And of course, another region also means another class of these beings that will work against you. He's called the ruler of the air. Now, in Greek, there's two words for air. The first is air, A-E-R. And A-E-R <clears throat> is the dim lower atmosphere. This is the air you and I breathe. It's It's... It's here. This is the air. There's also another word that means the rarefied air. Way up high where you can't breathe. So when you're on a plane, they got oxygen masks. It might come down. That's because the air is too thin for you to believe. That's to, to believe. To breathe. That's the rarefied air. That air in Greek is called aether. So two airs. Which air do you suppose he uses, Paul uses in this passage? You suppose he's using the upper air or the lower air? He's using the lower air. Think about that for a minute. He's the ruler of this lower air. Now, I just want you to see that there are demonic forces that will cause you trouble up in that second heaven. And there's demonic forces that will cause you trouble right here in this lower area of the air. They're rebels. And they want you to be a rebel like them. And this is why they trouble you. Their purpose is to make you and to influence you to be a rebel. Okay, we'll just, we'll just have to stop there. I just want to recap so you're clear. There are two regions where you're going to fight. The first region is going to be in the second heaven. 
where the princes and the kings and the rulers are. And the second realm is here on earth. There are evil forces that we contend with. And depending on which force you're contending with will determine how you battle. Does this make sense? Right? Don't, don't, don't go to a gunfight with a knife. You have certain weapons for certain warfares, and you have certain weapons for certain enemies. What I want you to understand is that sometimes people take on principalities and powers and rulers and authorities in their bedroom, asking Jesus to remove them. Okay, don't do that. Now, God protects those who are his. But do you understand, you, you've extended your authority into a place that it doesn't work. I thought we had all authority. We do have all authority. A big buzzword today, ecclesia or ecclesia. It just depends on, on who's buzzing the word, right? Or the ecclesia or the ecclesia. The ecclesia was a group that came together in a city-state. And if there was going to be war, they worked together and they decided we're going to war. We're not going to war. When we come together on Wednesday night, we come together as the ecclesia. In that position, we have the authority where two or more are gathered. Where two or more agree is touching any one thing. This is not something you do by yourself. And if you do, either God will protect you or you will find yourself getting hurt. Some of the some of the things that happen when you're fighting in an arena you don't belong in, you will start to see physical manifestations, nosebleeds, headaches, migraines, things you can't stop. You're fighting in an arena you don't belong in. And what's happened is you've probably overstepped into an area of authority. Does this make sense to you? Now, when we're dealing with the rulers of this air, i got great authority here. Right? They've overstepped into my arena of authority. Do you understand my house? That's my place of authority. That is my embassy in this place. Don't bring your business to my house. I've got authority there. Now, he's going to challenge my authority and say, no, you don't. I'm going to say, yes, you do. And one of us is going to get tossed out on their ear. And it's not going to be me. Because I'm operating in my authority. This makes sense to you. The devil wants you to rebel. He wants you to get out from under your covering of authority. And when you get out from under your covering of authority, you open yourself up to getting hit like this. Does this make sense to you? A lot of the reason why the enemy in this town has gotten people to go to church somewhere else. He doesn't want people who live in Fountain Hills to go to church in Fountain Hills. Because your authority here, because it's your home, is very high. He would rather see you go to McDowell Mountain and, and pray over Scottsdale. Because if you come here and pray where your authority is really high, well, he doesn't need that. Do you understand? There's rules to the game. There's always rules to the game. Each of these evil forces has a very specific arena of authority. And as a believer, you too have very specific arenas of authority. You have places where you can't lose. You need to learn what those places are. And you need to learn in arenas that are beyond you that we can come together. And then we have authority. See, all authority, Jesus said, has been given to me. All authority. So when the devil's down here doing his business, being the ruler of the air, he's actually overstepped his authority. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus is the one who has authority here now. Before his death and resurrection, that wasn't the case. It is today. Does this make some sense to you? Yeah, it's going to take more than just one or two days to go through all these things. And I, I could just go the whole rest of the day, but. Um, you'll get bored. So um, this is a place where we're going to start. I want to look next week at where your realms of authority lie and where Satan's realms of authority lie and how you can best exert your authority in the places where you have the authority. And I also want you to understand this. This is one of the reasons I brought that passage out with the offering. When we step into things that we don't fully understand, God will always back your move. He's not going to let you get into trouble. There's times I know people are taking on principalities and powers, and I can just see Jesus just going, not that one. Doesn't know what he's doing. Okay, but likewise, you also need to understand this. 
we as a church do step into some of these realms as the ecclesia. And we take on some of the rulers over this area. And so when the enemy comes after our church, he comes loaded for bear because we are a little bit, we're more of a threat. Does that make sense to you? So we pay attention. And this is why I wrote last night in the newsletter. You don't put on your armor when you hear the call to battle. It's too late then. You need to, you just need to be suited up all the time because the days are evil. Jesus, help us. Father, help us to be who you've called us to be. And Father, I pray that you would help us to lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of us. Father, I pray for those today who have heard fear in this message. Father, I pray that you would calm their hearts. I pray, Father, that you would strengthen their hearts, steal their hearts. All authority in heaven and earth has been given me, Jesus said. All authority. And so, Father, we take up the authority you've given us. Father, I pray that you would help us to learn to do battle in the right way. Father, so that we can accomplish the things that you have for us to accomplish. So, Lord, today now I bless your people. I strengthen them. Father, for those who have found themselves in battles today, Father, I pray you'd refresh their soul. I pray, Father, you'd strengthen them. I pray, Father, you'd encourage their heart. And I pray, Father, you would show them the path to victory. I bless them now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I went over, but you can take it up with my boss. <laughs> On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in memory of me. And in the same way, when the supper had ended, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks, and gave the cup to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and drink it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which will be shed for you so that your sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Lord, we're grateful for your great love, greater love than we could possibly imagine, that you pour out on us and, and continue now to pour out on us. We pray, God, for your grace and mercy and that uh, we will sense that love in the days to come. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Today I shared with you a little bit about the enemies that we face. I want you to know this. God has equipped you, given you everything you need, not only to face them, but to defeat them. I want you to know that he has not left you as orphans. He has empowered you with weapons you can't even imagine. And in the coming days, we'll talk about them more. In the meantime, Father, I bless your people. Father, I'm so thankful for them. Father, thank you for this house. Father, I pray that you would make this people the head and not the tail. I speak your favor over them. I speak, Father, your provision over them. I speak, Father, your life over them. I pray, Father, you would help us as a group to enter into the gifts and the call of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, you'd help us to lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of us. Make our mouths, Father, a gospel horn. Father, may the signs and wonders promised in your scriptures, may they follow us according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Prayer team will be up here if you would like prayer. Otherwise, I'll see you Tuesday night.